So information about identity of things in the scene, um, precise three-dimensional shape of everything, information about uh, the material composition of what you're looking at, information about uh, the physical state and uh, energetic potentials of things you're looking at, um, information about light and space, and in uh, scenes like this where there are people, information about age, health, mood, intention, um, information about value, about fitness, and all of this is immediately available. In fact, uh, a lot of times when I talk to people who are not neuroscientists about what I study, I study vision, they don't even get it. Even though they're so incredibly good at getting all of these tens of thousands of uh, words of information from a scene, to them it seems trivial, it's easy, it's not something they have to try to do. In fact, it's something that it's pretty much impossible not to do. Um, <clears throat> and you can partly uh, understand what they're saying based on the fact that you, you look at a scene like this and it's, it's right there, it's an image. The information is all there in the image. What, what uh, else is there to say? Uh, so it's a good question. Um, why isn't the image itself good enough? Why isn't the, why isn't the copy of the image uh, on the photoreceptors in your eye good enough? to just um, give you all of this information about the world. So here's why. The, um, yeah. So all the information we're going to get about the visual world is at the photoreceptor layer in the retina of the eye. So it is all there, but it's not in a usable form. First of all, because it's incredibly distributed across megapixels worth of channels, uh, and that's a really unwieldy signal. So visual information has to be stored in memory. It has to be used by many different parts of the brain. You can't afford to use 10,000, um, or you can't afford to use millions of axons to convey visual information to every other part of the brain. You can't afford to change millions of synapses to store something, uh, some kind of visual memory in the brain. So it's way too large a signal. Um, <clears throat> the information that we need, the information uh, that makes up the 10,000 words that we could write about a complex scene like this is there, but it's extremely implicit. That is, it would take lots and lots of operations by the brain or by a computer program to pull that information out. So too implicit to be usable, you can't just send that information to the rest of the brain and think uh, that other parts of the brain can use it. And then finally, it's in an extremely unstable state. Information, visual information on the eye is constantly changing because you're constantly moving your eyes. Uh, things are getting closer, further away. They're changing their pose or um, orientation. Lighting is changing. Uh, they're partially occluded. Uh, and all of these changes mean that the representation of the visual image on the eye is changing drastically from second to second. That is, the pattern of activations one second has nothing to do with the pattern of activations in another second. But of course, you need information that is stable. Basically, everything that I need to know about this room visually is stable. I want it to continue to appear that way to me as I'm looking around. Uh, so in that sense, the information on my retina is not very useful because it's changing uh, amazingly. So the reason why we need a visual system and the reason why um, so much of uh, the surface of the brain is devoted to uh, processing visual information across uh, over 30 different uh, cortical regions that do different aspects of that processing um, <clears throat> all of that machinery takes the image information, which is so distributed, implicit, and um, unstable, and converts it into neural codes, neural representations that are, first of all, compressed 
down into a small enough number of signals that um, uh, you could reasonably send uh, the information across a bundle of axons to another part of the brain that needs to use it. You could reasonably store the information in memory by changing a reasonable number of synapses. So compressed, the information is explicit. So we need easy to read signals for things like the identity of the object, the shape of an object, the material that an object is made of, the physical uh, state of everything that's in the world. We need easy to read signals because um, we can't expect the rest of the brain every time to do all the operations on image information that would be required to pull that kind of information out. So uh, we need a neural code that's easy to read for the rest of the brain and can be stored in an easy to read format in memory. And finally, um, <clears throat> the visual system has to transform image information in information into a representation that is stable, a representation that will remain at least partially the same as uh, things move on your retina or change size or rotate uh, or lighting changes or occlusion changes. So this is the most important slide for both of these lectures and everything that I'll talk about really relates to this question of um, how does the visual system transform image information, which is relatively useless, into useful information by compressing it, making it explicit, and uh, making it stable. Throughout the outline, you'll see that the notes associated with every slide have bolded parts and non-bolded parts. And um, uh, the bolded parts represent things that you actually have to know uh, in order to answer exam questions. And the unbolded parts um, are explanatory things that will help you to understand what's written in bold um, uh, or provide more information if you're interested. But I've tried to um, uh, keep the amount of information uh, in bold that's really important to know for an exam uh, to a minimum. So for example, I haven't bolded anything in the text that goes along with this slide because um, I don't think it's important for the purposes of these two lectures for you to memorize anything about the anatomy of the eye. The important thing for our purposes is that there, um, there are parts in the front of the eye that form an image projected onto the back of the eye where the retina is and that image that can consists of light and energy is transformed by the retina into neural signals. Again, not that much that you uh, would have to know uh, from this slide here. This is uh, a diagram of the retina. Uh, so um, this is the inside of the eyeball right here. This is the outside of the eyeball, the retina. Here's a blow up of it. And um, <clears throat> it shows some of the major cell types. So first of all, um, counterintuitively, even though light is coming this way, it passes through all the rest of the retina before it gets to the parts of the photoreceptors where light is absorbed and transduced into neural signal. And the two um, uh, cell types back here that do that transduction are the rods and cones. Rods are extremely sensitive to light, uh, but the rod system has low spatial resolution. That is, they don't give you the most finely detailed information about uh, the world. Cones uh, have lower light sensitivity, so they don't work in the dark, but they have much higher spatial resolution. Um, and they have three different pigment types, and that's the basis for color vision. So um, this outer layer here is made up of uh, rods and cones. The middle layer um, has bipolar cells. These are the relay cells that the rods and cones synapse onto, and then the bipolar cells synapse onto the retinal ganglion cells. And retinal ganglion cells are the cells that send their axons out the optic nerve. Uh, so that's how all the information gets out of the eye. So you've got uh, your um, 
uh, photoreceptor cells, you've got your bipolar cells, uh, your retinal ganglion cells, that's the three-part relay system for getting light information out through the optic nerve. And then there are also horizontal cells and amacrine cells that modulate what's going on at synapses between uh, photoreceptor cells and bipolar cells and synapses between bipolar cells and um, retinal ganglion cells. Also counterintuitively, uh, when light is transduced, there's actually a decrease in transmitter release. And that's because given, uh, for photoreceptor cells, given the uh, ongoing balance between sodium influx and potassium outflux from uh, the cell, the um, cell is relatively hyperpolarized. And, um, when light is absorbed, uh, a series of things that occur that result in the closure of uh, cyclic GMP-gated uh, sodium channels. So you uh, stop getting as many positive ions in the cell, it becomes more depolarized, and that's when... Um, oh, sorry. Um, so. I, I apologize, I said that backwards. So in the dark, photoreceptor cells are in fact depolarized and they are, re they are releasing uh, transmitter. When light is absorbed, uh, that causes closure of sodium ions, the cells become hyperpolarized and that transmitter release is uh, stopped. So um, uh, the counterintuitive counter part of it is that absorption of light leads to a decrease in transmitter release. Um, light is absorbed by pigment, pigment mole molecules in uh, uh, photoreceptor cells. The pigment mole molecule in rods is rhodopsin, and that absorption leads to a cascade of molecular events that eventually breaks down cyclic GMP. And because cyclic GMP is necessary to keep this sodium channel open, um, that's why the sodium channel closes, leading to depolarization of the cell, hyperpolarization of the cell, and decrease in transmitter release. The only thing to take from this cell here is that if you look at the distribution of rods and cones across the <coughs> retina, um, at the center of vision, the fovea, the part of the eye that you use to look at something when you want to see it in detail, that's why we're constantly moving our eyes, uh, you just have cones and they're very densely packed and they have a one-to-one -one relationship with um, uh, their bipolar cells. And as a result, information coming from uh, the retina has very high spatial acuity. As you move further away from the retina, the number of tones uh, of the number of cones quickly decreases, the number of rods quickly increases, and out towards uh, the periphery, away from the fovea, it's mostly rods. You may have noticed um, that if you're in a really, really dark room and you're trying to look at something, you can actually see it more clearly when you look a little bit to the side. That's because cones are inoperative in really low light conditions. So if you look a little bit to the side, you're bringing uh, a part of your retina to bear that has rods so that you can see. So I mentioned before there are three types of cones, each with a uh, different type of opsin, and the ab absorbance uh, spectrum, the absorbent or ab absorbent function of uh, each of those opsins across the um, visible light spectrum is different, um, uh, ranging from short uh, to long wavelengths, and it's the ratios of activations between these different opsins that is the basis of color vision. And we won't talk any more about uh, color vision, which is obviously a major uh, topic in vision, but not enough time to talk about it in uh, two lectures. <laughs>
So um, you've probably run across in this course already the definition of a receptive field for any um, spatial domain. Uh, the receptive field represents a part of that domain in which uh, a neuron is sensitive to uh, energy uh, from the environment. For photoreceptor cells, uh, the receptive field or spatial domain is a small spot um, uh, that uh, represents the place uh, uh, in the image where they transduce light. But one of the major early discoveries in vision was that if you look at the receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells, uh, they're not simply small spots that respond uh, to light, they have a center surround structure. So for example, an own center cell will respond to um, the onset of light right at the center of its receptive field. Um, it won't respond to uh, dark at the center of the receptive field. Uh, and this diagram shows how it will respond to that spot of light, uh, but then <clears throat> uh, adding light to the surround will actually turn off the response. Um, <clears throat> So responsive to an own center cell is responsive to a small spot of light in the center, but it's inhibited by light in the surround. And then there are off center cells that respond to a dark darkening at the center of the receptive field. But if everything is dark around the sur surround, that'll stop uh, its response. The, um, the mechanism by which uh, those on-center and off-center receptive fields are built has to do with modulation by uh, horizontal cells. So horizontal cells actually convey the antagonistic signal from the surround. But you don't have to um, uh, learn any, of, any further details about that mechanism. Oh, sorry, what, what this is actually illustrating is uh, just the idea of um, a bipolar cell and the difference between on and off center ganglion cells depends on which kind of uh, bipolar cell is uh, present and whether it's activated or inhibited, inhibited by the glutamate released by the uh, photoreceptor cell. And then this is a diagram that um, describes how um, antagonistic modulation from the horizontal cells um, antagonize the effect of light or dark at the center. So what does all this have to do with the operation of the visual system? Why should you suddenly find center surround receptive fields in um, uh, retinal ganglion cells? Well, this is actually a major compression step. Remember, we talked about the three things the visual system has to do is it has to compress information, make it explicit, make it stable. This is major compression in this sense. So um, if uh, you've got a, um, a field of light and a field of dark, What's happening with photoreceptor cells is across that entire field of dark, you've got lots of photoreceptor cells um, that are um, uh, giving a dark response. And down here, you've got lots and lots of photoreceptor cells giving a light response. And across the, uh, the whole eye, this is many megapixels of signals. But, but it's kind of wasteful because we don't really need to have all that redundant information about uh, big areas like the blackboard or the wall that um, really nothing is changing across. It's just a big uh, area of uh, a common uh, brightness and color. So uh, how do retinal ganglion cells uh, um, operate? Uh, if you've got uh, big fields of dark or big fields of light. Well, in the dark, um, the, um, and the relationship between um, the 
Well, in the dark, if you've got an own center cell, you're not going to have any response at all. Um, as you move towards the edge, um, you'll get, uh, again, very little response. Actually, uh, uh, a little depression of response due to the antagonistic surround being stimulated by light. If you're right on the edge like this, then uh, you've got half your receptive field stimulated, so you've got half of the on center stimulated, half of the off center surround stimulated, and then this other half is not stimulated at all. So you have, um, uh, you've gone back to your standard level of spontaneous activity. And you only get a real response when you get to this point where uh, the position of the receptive field with regard to the edge between lightness and darkness is such that Sorry. So you only get a big response at this point where the entire on center is stimulated, but not all of the off center, uh, off, uh, not all of the uh, off surround is stimulated. So that finally there's an imbalance between the activation at the center and the inhibition uh, at the uh, surround, and that's when you get a strong response from a retinal ganglion cell. So why is this a compression step? Because again, uh, for really large surfaces that are giving you just the same brightness and color information, that information is redundant. And most of the um, non-redundant important information in a complex scenes occurs at the places where you have a transition in contrast between bright and dark, between red and green, etc. So the retinal ganglion cells only respond to those transitions. So you can go from many megapixels of information distributed across photoreceptor cells to about a million retinal ganglion cells uh, coming out of the eyes. So that's a, a major con uh, compression step for the system. So the retinal ganglion cells exit um, uh, the back of the eye the, their axons exit the back of the eye into the optic nerves. The optic nerves curve around to the optic chiasm. At the, chi at the chiasm, the axons from the nasal part of the retina cross to the other side. Uh, as a result, in each optic track, you wind up uh, with all the axons that are signaling information about the opposite side of space. And this is why uh, it's always the right, at, at least at uh, early and intermediate stages, it's the right half of the brain dealing with the left half of space and left half of brain dealing with the right half of space. The next stage after the retina is the lateral geniculate, geniculate nucleus, or LGN. Uh, its response properties largely mirror those in um, uh, retinal ganglion cells. Uh, it's uh, the major relay nucleus for vision. LGN neurons project primarily to primary visual cortex, or V1, which is in the occipital lobe. They project uh, via the optic radiations. And um, the segregation <coughs> of um, signals between eyes, which is uh, maintained in different layers of the LGN, is also uh, maintained in layer 4 of V1, but after that, eye signals are mixed. So the... Um,
Retina naturally has a map of visual space in it because it's responding to uh, an image of visual space uh, that's projected onto the back of the eye. But that um, uh, so-called retinotopic map of visual space is maintained in the lateral geniculus, it's maintained in primary visual cortex, and it's actually maintained to some degree um, beyond uh, primary visual cortex into some of the um, subsequent intermediate processing stages in the visual system. And that's represented here. So um, this is meant to be a map of visual space where the fovea is represented by red and the periphoveal region about yellow and then you've got green, blue, purple and you can see how that's mapped across the brain. So this is not a human brain now, it's a macaque monkey brain and you'll see a lot of stuff from the macaque monkey brain because most of what we know about vision comes from uh, experimental work in monkeys. And in monkeys uh, as opposed to humans the, uh, um, the V1 retinotopic map is not inside on the medial surface of the brain. Most of it is uh, outside uh, on, the, on the outside surface of the occipital lobe. <clears throat> so when people started studying the responses of neurons in um, V1, they thought, well, uh, little spots of light work well in the retina, so we'll try that. And people did that for a long time. And it was only by accident that uh, Hubel and Weasel, who later um, received the Nobel Prize for this and related work, uh, discovered that while these cells were impossible to drive with little spots of light, they could be driven with edges of light, or with bars of light, or with bars of dark. And this is an example of one of their results. Uh, this is results for a single neuron in um, primary visual cortex of a monkey. Um, what uh, they've done in this diagram is to roughly draw the receptive field of the neuron um, uh, with, the, with this dashed rectangle. And what's shown here is what happens as they take um, a, a dark bar and pass it back and forth across the receptive field at different orientations. Uh, and you can see, so what's over here actually is a picture of an oscilloscope trace with t time compressed enough that each action potential emitted by the cell um, uh, just shows up as a hash mark. Uh, you can see up here there, there are no hash marks, so passing a vertical bar across the receptive field evoked no responses. In contrast, down here, passing uh, a diagonal bar across the receptive field evoked lots of action potentials. And as the um, orientation of the bar changed from diagonal to slightly off diagonal, the responses went down until they were around zero for horizontal, around zero for uh, vertical. So that's an example of orientation tuning, uh, maybe the most famous property of uh, neurons in V4. But again, why orientation tuning? Uh, what, what does this gain the visual system? What does it have to do with the goals of the visual system? That is compression, explicit representation, and stability. So to answer that, we have to consider that um, the receptive fields of of V1 neurons are larger than the receptive fields of retinal ganglion cells. And if you look at pieces of the natural world, uh, apertures on the natural world, on the scale of V1 receptive fields, what do you see? You don't see little spots of light. You actually see uh, most frequently edges. And that's because of how things are structured in our world. So we don't live in a world of bits uh, where the bits are placed randomly and everything looks like uh, TV snow. If we did, we wouldn't have simple cells that had orientation tuning. Instead, we live in a world in which many physical principles, biological growth um, principles, principles uh, by which we construct 
our environment involves smoothness. That is, things aren't infinitely jagged on a very small scale. They tend to be smooth. Um, organisms have uh, smooth surfaces. Things we build have smooth surfaces, etc. So, if in a picture like this, and we already know that the retinal ganglion cells are mainly just signaling information about this edge between the white part and the dark part here, uh, if you look at what's going on inside a V1 receptive field, um, it's, it's going to be an, a smooth edge that has a particular orientation. And if you can signal that orientation with uh, the response of uh, a V1 cell that is tuned for that orientation, tuned for horizontal up here, or a cell tuned for vertical up here, then you've represented what's going on in that part of the visual world very efficiently, even more efficiently than you were representing it with the row of uh, receptive uh, of retinal ganglion cells that uh, represents this in the retina. So another really critical compression step for the system. So, um, in the monkey brain, uh, V1 is back here, um, and uh, that's our diagram for the size of V1 receptive fields. As you move forward in um, visual cortex, receptive fields get larger and larger. So, uh, just like in any kind of uh, neural network, whether it's uh, biological or artificial, um, uh, as you move up to higher layers, each unit in a higher layer is talking, is getting input from many units in a lower layer, which means that if you trace all the way down to the image, your receptive field is larger. You're getting information about a larger part of the receptive field. So, um, um, Right after V1, uh, the next stage in uh, visual processing is V2, but we'll look at V4. Um, area V4 is the first stage in the so-called ventral pathway that's exclusively devoted to object vision. V4 receptive fields are <clears throat> um, approximately equal to their eccentricity in uh, degrees. So if you want to measure things in the visual field, you measure them in terms of degrees of visual angle, where a degree of visual angle is approximately the subtense of your uh, little finger at arm's length. So that's about a degree. And V1 neurons are going to have receptive fields that are fractions of degrees. Uh, but V4 neurons are going to have receptive fields that are about a degree Y at the fovea, and they get wider as you go far away. So if you're 10 degrees away from the fovea, then the uh, diameter of a V4 receptive field would be about 10 degrees. And that's true throughout most of the visual system. You, you concentrate a lot of smaller receptive fields on the fovea, where you've got really fine vision, and then as you move away into the periphery, um, everything is coarser. So whereas in V1 receptive field uh, size apertures typically enclose regions that uh, are smooth and have a single uh, orientation in them, uh, V4 receptive fields uh, are frequently going to represent a large enough part of the world that there will be multiple orientations in that part of the world. So there's a change in orientation uh, for any given object boundary. It's smooth on a fairly local scale, but then at, at some parts there'll be uh, abrupt or gradual changes in orientation. Changes in orientation are what we call curvature. Curvature is the derivative of orientation. And um, in V4, in order to compress information like uh, this angle here or this angle here, you see neurons that are tuned um, for curvature. That is change in orientation. You had a question? Sorry, so I was wondering what you mean by degrees, isn't that gradual degrees? Okay. Uh, uh, degrees like you would measure with a protract protractor, degrees of angle. Um, uh, if you use millimeters, then it changes depending on how close you're talking about. Degrees let you talk about a piece of visual space that's the same whether you're looking at something close up or far away. 
So, so here's an example of uh, an experiment on a single neuron in area V4 of a macaque monkey done with lots of different shapes um, uh, and uh, all those shapes are shown here as white icons and then for this cell the response in spikes or action potentials per second is indicated by how dark the background is. So the background is really black that means about 35 spikes per second. That's a very strong response for a V4 neuron. Uh, if the responses are uh, medium gray, um, maybe around 15 spikes per second. And then if there's no response at all, very light gray. So if you um, look at uh, the high response stimuli, you'll notice that they don't have the same shape. Uh, one of the uh, things that early neurophysiologists always looked for in, um, in trying to drive cells was some single best stimulus that would evoke the highest response uh, from uh, a neuron. But by the time you get to V4, you see that there are actually a number of very different uh, shape stimuli that evoke uh, strong responses. But if you stare long enough, what you'll notice is that the common uh, factor in all these shape stimuli is that they have very sharp convex curvature, a sharp, sharp convex point near the top. Uh, so the, um, the tuning of this cell is specific, uh, not for the overall shape of an object, but for one part of an object, the top of an object. Um, and um, you can represent that tuning function, function down here just like you can represent an orientation tuning function. Um, this axis here is a position of um, <clears throat> a part or fragment of uh, the shape relative to the center of the shape where, um, where 90 degrees means near the top, zero degrees means to the right, 180 means to the left, and 270 means towards the bottom. And then um, the curvature of um, the contour at uh, that part of the shape is represented here on the vertical axis where uh, zero means flat. If you had uh, uh, something straight, uh, curvature would be zero. Um, 0.5 means uh, broad convex curvature, convex being pushing out from the center of the shape, and um, 1.0 corresponds to infinitely sharp curvature. So the one way that we uh, parameterize uh, curvature numerically is as inverse radius, and the smaller uh, radius gets, the higher curvature gets um, until it's uh, infinite. And um, so the tuning function fitted to uh, the responses of this cell, which do a great job, which does a great job of predicting the responses of this cell to these stimuli, is shown here uh, based on this color scale where red means high responses and then um, lower, lower responses as you, as you go through the spectrum to blue. And the peak for this cell <coughs> is right around 90 degrees and uh, centered on curvature 1.0, which corresponds to what you can see here, that you get high, response, high responses to stimuli that have a sharp point near the top of an object. So I mentioned that um, you've got a retinotopic map in V1 and V2. You've still got a retinotopic map in V4, but in V4, you begin to see the, the uh, transition from coding information in retinotopic space, which is certainly true for photo, uh, uh, photo receptor cells, certainly true for retinal ganglion cells. Basically, they code where something is in space by virtue of having a set position relative to um, the retina. By the time you get to V4, Receptive fields are larger, so if you were relying on retinotopic coding, you'd, you'd have uh, um, pretty low resolution. But in fact, um, 
what's happening uh, throughout the visual system as you move away from V1 is there's a transformation from retinotopic coding of space into object-centered coding of space. And that's illustrated here. <clears throat> so um, this is a different cell that responds to sharp convex points near the upper right. Um, and as you move that stimulus up, down, to the right, to the left, you see that the cell keeps responding. Highest response at the receptive field center, but still pretty high responses over a range of uh, positions within the receptive field. And no responses to this very similar stimulus that lacks that sharp point uh, near the upper right. But then here's the striking thing. So you've got big changes in position of this shape, including the sharp point occurring here, and you've got fairly stable responses. What's done here is to make very small changes in the position of that point relative to the rest of the object. And uh, even though sensitivity of this neuron to retinotopic position of the whole object is low, sensitivity to position of the sharp point relative to the rest of the object is quite high. So remember this uh, cell is tuned for sharp convex uh, angles near the upper right of the shape. And as you gradually move away from the upper right, you go towards the upper left, you go towards the lower left, or you go towards the, yeah, uh, moving up in this direction, you're moving it back towards the lower left, or you're moving it towards the upper right. Or here in this series, you're moving it from the upper right to the upper left, you can see that responses gradually grow down. So this neuron has gradual tuning and very acute tuning for the exact position of uh, that sharp point relative to the rest of the object. <clears throat> so what we've seen so far for V4, um, which is uh, that there's um, tuning not for entire shapes, but for parts of shapes. And that part of that tuning for parts of shapes has to do with representing where that part is relative to the rest of the shape is totally consistent with uh, a, um, a long running theory about how the brain might represent objects in terms of parts, parts-based representation or configural coding, representing objects as configurations of parts. And this is a famous diagram from David Marr, pardon me, um, showing how a human body might be represented in terms of um, coarse parts like the torso, the head, the arms, and the legs, or if you needed more detailed vision, you might represent uh, something as fine as the hand in terms of the palm and the, uh, and the fingers. So this is a theory that was first uh, proposed by a couple of people. Uh, Oliver Selfridge to begin with in the 1950s. It's been around for a long time, uh, only recently got real empirical support. Um, <clears throat> why was this considered such a, um, uh, an attractive theory for a long time? <clears throat> well, co configural coding, that is, representing an object as a collection of parts where you have a signal for the shape of a part and you've got a signal for um, the uh, position relative to the rest of the object of that part. And the whole object is represented by an ensemble of neurons that are representing the shapes and positions of different parts, achieves a lot of the goals that we set out for the visual system. First of all, the number of parts is potentially small. Um, especially if you think of a coarse representation of the human body, torso, legs, arms, head, that's only uh, six parts. Of course, you really need uh, more part information to represent um, a human body in a detailed way. But still, this is a way of taking 
um, segments of information that um, you know used to be represented by thousands of uh, uh, photoreceptor cells and representing them potentially with one or a few signals in an area like V4 that represents uh, a significantly sized part of an object. So a major compression step. Um, configure coding is very expensive explicit about the nature of individual parts and how parts are spatially configured. Uh, and that's important because this is something we need to know about, we do know about. We can talk about um, the structure of an object. I can tell you how you put together an automobile where the parts go, um, uh, the tires on the bottom and the windshield in the front, etc. Uh, so it's knowledge that we use about the world and um, this is an explicit representation of that, an exp explicit representation, for example, that the sharp point is near the top of a teardrop-shaped object. There is also a potentially massive gain in stability inherent in the transformation from retinotopic space into object-centered space. In retinotopic space, if something changes position on the retina or changes size, then um, um, the representation by the retinal ganglion cells or even V1 neurons is going to change completely, completely different cells involved. But if you transform from retinotopic into object-centered, then as the object changes position on the retina, and even as it changes size, still the object relative position of its parts remain the same. For a human body, the head remains at the top, the arms uh, near the top right and left, the legs at the bottom, etc. So compression, explicit coding of things we need to know, stable coding of um, objects in the world. And in addition, it's a very productive code. That is, with a relatively finite number of signals, it can produce a virtually infinite number of representations. And this has always been considered to be a conundrum about the visual system. You do all this processing, you get a certain number of cells uh, at the final stages that talk to the rest of the brain, but do you have enough cells to represent the, um, the, the infinity of different objects that uh, we can see in the world? I could take a jar of Play-Doh and it could sit here sculpting 50 different things that you've never seen before, um, but you are able to see them, you are able to describe them, you are able to remember them. So a parts-based code allows you to do that by describing things in terms of commonly seen parts in different combinations, you can have a relatively small number of neurons that encode uh, a virtual infinity of shapes, somewhat analogous to the way that we can represent um, millions of words in English as just different combinations of 26 letters of the alphabet. Should we stop now? Do we usually go to... 120 or? Okay. We're done. Thanks.